look at what does the scripture says about us following the other cultures or customs that we and the tradition that is in 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 different land now the whole world is condemned and is under under sin that's what we studied in romans and we know that there is not a single person on planet earth who is righteous no not one and all that we do is definitely sinful every tradition every custom every culture is fallen in sin and tainted in sin let's look at a couple of verses if we can turn to leviticus chapter 18 leviticus chapter 18 and um reading from verse 1 and the lord spoke unto moses saying speak to the children of israel and say unto them i am the lord your god after the doings in in a <clears throat> kgv it says after the doing of the land of egypt in other version it will say after the customs of egypt wherein you dwelt shall you not shall you not do and after the doings of the land of canaan whether i bring shall you not do neither shall you walk in their ordinances you shall do my judgment and keep my ordinances to walk therein i am the lord your god and uh, this phrase i am the lord your god comes very often and if we can remember exodus chapter 20 let's we'll go to that later but he says i'm the lord your god who brought you out of the land of egypt and elsewhere, you know that in Leviticus, God says, do not even, you should have no leaven when you're leaving Egypt. Not even the leaven of Egypt. But what did God allow Israel to take <coughs> from Egypt? Gold, silver, because they were not paid wages. God is just. And here it is, he says, he's telling Moses, he says, speak to the children of Israel. Who, you know, Israel was God's own. Here we are thinking of the nation Israel. God has chosen the nation Israel and he's delivering his people from Egypt. He's bringing them out of Egypt. And then he says, say unto them, I am the Lord your God. Why is he saying that? I am the Lord your God. Isn't he saying because he is sovereign? He is the I am that I am. He has right over his people. He is the one who rules over them. He's the only one who has the right to give them commandments of what they need to do and what they shouldn't do. So he says, I am the Lord your God. In other words, there cannot be any other lords apart from me. There cannot be any other gods apart from me. And then he says in verse 3, And, and after the doings of what is done in the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, you shall not do. Don't follow the practices of the Egyptian. What are the practices of Egyptian? Worshipping the other gods? Worshipping Pharaoh? Worshipping power.
and every culture is so intertwined with the religion that they believe in. And then he says, after the doing of the land of Canaan, now he talks of Egypt, he talks of the land that they are going to go into. So he says, don't bring anything from Egypt into the land, that, into the promised land I'm giving you. And don't take anything, any of the tradition from the land of Canaan. Neither shall you walk in the statutes or the ordinances. And if Brother Schaefer and I, we have made such a long list of Hindu culture that has entered into our church. And a few of them is when people get married, they throw rice on their head as though rice is the one who's going to bless them. You know, when they send wedding cards, they put saffron at the end corners of the wedding card. We have brought in every kind of tradition from Hinduism and got into it. What about Thali chain? We just put a pendant and say, okay, they do it in a different way. They, they have a different connotation for it, but we are putting cross on it. There are so many things that we have followed. What about dowry? And then he goes on to say in verse 4, you shall do my judgment and keep my statutes. What I tell you, you are to do that, not <clears throat> what the world is dictating to you or what the culture is saying to you. And, and then it goes to say, to walk in therein. And again, God is telling Moses, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord, your God. If we can turn to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 20, In Ezekiel 20, <clears throat> we can look at um, verse 7. Okay, let's go to verse 5. And say unto them, God is, uh, God is telling to Ezekiel, Thus says the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel and lifted up my hand unto the seed of the house of Israel, and, <clears throat> and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up my hand, upon unto them saying, I am the Lord your God. In that day, I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had aspired for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then verse seven. Then I said unto them, cast you away every man the abominations of his eyes. And defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You know, everything that is done, be it in Indian culture or any of the pagan culture, is one thing that we know is that they have to appease their gods.
and he says, defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt, and I am the Lord, your God. What God told Moses, God is telling Ezekiel the same thing. Verse 8. <clears throat> but they rebelled against me and would not listen to me. They did not every man cast away the abomination of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. God is warning us very clearly, do not follow the traditions of the world, the culture of the world. Turn with me to 1 John. <clears throat> One John chapter two. <clears throat> he says, "Love not the world." Verse fifteen. One John chapter two, verse fifteen. Love not the world. What does he mean by the world here? Is God contradicting himself with John three sixteen that God so loved the world? We know John 3, 16, God loved his elect very much. But what is God saying? Love not the world. What? We will come to that. What does he mean by love not the world? Neither the things that are in the world. Don't set your affection on the things that are in the world. Isn't it? He is talking of the system of the world, the philosophies of the world, the traditions of the world. And it is so clear here, he says, if any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. If any man loves the world, then he very clearly says, God's love is not in you. You love the traditions of the world. You love the practices, practices of the world. The philosophies of the world. What the world values, you value. He says, the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> Verse 16, he defines what is in the world. For all that is in the world, number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. Number three, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we can go back to Genesis because the things of the world is basically to make us to disobey the commandments of God. Because the world is at enmity with God. Turn with me to Exodus 20. You see, uh, let's go to Exodus 19, beginning at verse 17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the nether part of the mountain. 
and Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it at, in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses <coughs> spake and God answered him by a voice. The Lord came down upon, the, upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain and, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, go down, charge the people or warn the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. Let the priest also who come near to the Lord, mark this word, sanctify themselves or consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break them forth. And Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come up to the mountain for thou charges are saying, set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto them, and unto him, away, get thee down and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priest and the people break through to come unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake to them. And verse chapter 20, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And the first commandment he gives is, thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall have no other gods before me. That's the very first commandment he gives them. Why? He says, I am the one who is living. I'm the one who is alive. I'm life. I am that I am. All other gods are idols made of hands. And he says, Egypt is bondage. And there can be no other God can deliver you as I have delivered you. So he says, and he gives the very first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't look at the world, what the world is doing, but I'm the only one who can save you. There is no other way of salvation. I'm the only one who can break you from the bondage of sin. The world needs the gospel. And only the gospel will sanctify everything. Why will the gospel sanctify the things of the world? Because the gospel, gospel will bring us back to Christ. And the gospel will cause us to look to Christ and what Christ has said. He will want us to do it. Deuteronomy. Chapter 5. He says the same thing. <clears throat> let, let me go to verse 5. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgment which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn and keep and do them. What is God wanting us to do? Only what he commands us. Nothing else. <clears throat> Verse 
And then he says, that you may learn and keep and do them. The Lord your God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. And verse 6, I am the Lord your God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He, he repeats that constantly. Leviticus 20. Verse 22. <clears throat> you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. 23. You shall not walk in the manners or customs of nations, of the nation which I cast before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. He says, you shall not walk in the manners or customs of these nations. What is the rule book for me? Is the, is the scriptures, what God has told us. Turn with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man plunder you or take you captive to philosophy. What is philosophy? Love of wisdom. Or empty deceit according to the tradition of men. Some traditions look so nice. They are so self-gratifying, saying the way they behave. Take, for example, the Japanese. When they thank you, they bend down so well. But the scripture tells us, Every man is proud. You can have a form externally. Which is a tradition of men. And after the basic principles of the world, not after Christ. What the world is doing, we want to follow that. Let the scriptures be our rule book. Let the gospel rule over our hearts. Let's, let us let Christ be exalted and let us look at look to Christ and do what He tells, tells us to do. Anything apart from that is sin. If, as we are in Colossians, you can look at um, <clears throat> verse 20. Colossians 2. 20. Therefore, if you be dead with Christ from the basic principles or from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world 
are you subject to ordinances or subject to rules such as touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things are indeed, he says, a show of wisdom in will worship. They have an appearance of wisdom in them. And it's a self-imposed religion. A religion that the scripture does not tell, talk, tell us about. It, a religion that is contrary to the scriptures. And it shows a form of humility. And it gives a severe treatment to the body. but of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. Not, it has no value. It's a form of show that the world can see through it. <clears throat> Sarojanti and I were talking, even Yoga is so sinful, though they say it's only an exercise. But it is sun worship. And it's, it's worship of the false gods. We need to be very careful <clears throat> when with the culture and the tradition that is in the world and to find out the root of it. And just not say, oh, it's say, for example, even a bindi that is put on the forehead we can easily say, oh, it's a beauty spot. It's not beauty spot, it is something else that has come. And every custom is, has a link to their idols. And false worship. May God help us to remove all of them one by one. May God help reveal those things to us. And may God help us to see the truth. I've seen so much of uh, tradition or Hindu culture entering the church. I believe even when people are constructing church, they look at Vastu. I've seen when pastors buy a new car or vehicle, they put lime under the tires. May God remove every tradition of men from our midst. Pastor, I have a small uh, uh, I mean, it's a query. 
Am I audible, Pastor? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. My query is that uh, uh, people who live in uh, communities like uh, apartments, uh, gated communities, where, you know, all festivals are celebrated and we have small children. Small children, like, you know, in the believing families, they are also in the same community where all religions are there. I'm not able to... I'm not able to hear you clearly. Can you be a little louder? Hello, how is yeah. this, Pastor? Yeah, my yeah. question, my query, like, you know, just want to understand though what I'm asking, I understand it. Uh, where uh, there are families who are living in a mixed cultured uh, uh, communities. Like in a camp, in a, in a uh, you know, community like where all religions are being celebrated and uh, there are believing families who have small children and uh, for example Navratri time Bangra will be you know all children will be going together and then how do believing family children we small children like you know especially uh, grown-up children at least we can explain them but the small children how do we restrict restrict them Ah, age is not the criterion because the spirit of God will work in all ages. Number two, you have to keep on giving them the gospel that they hear the gospel so clearly that Christ is unique and all these are just fun that is related to a religion. I know, say, for example, even during Diwali, children are so attracted to the crackers and the fireworks. You, you have to explain to them why that is wrong. I hope I was clear, Sister Nazarena. Uh, there are two things you know you know you have to keep on talking to them about christ and the uniqueness of christ yes so uh... In the church uh, Sunday school need to be well equipped. To... Sorry, I will. I will not say it is the duty of the parents, not the duty of the Sunday school. Anyway, that is. Uh, I agree with you, Pastor. But uh, there are certain uh, you know children being together and having a you know mixed activity. Those things. Uh, alone, you know, we need to create. That's what I'm saying. I didn't get so you. I, I taught in a Sunday. I mean, in a church, in a junior junior church. So we created a lot of activities for children on Sundays only, and uh, so that was uh, that was helping them to have uh, mixed activities with uh, fun also because. Uh, many times uh, children, when they see the other religions seem to have more fun activities compared to church. So that's what I'm saying. You know, you brother, I think, I think what you said was right, brother. I think uh, more than the Sunday school, it's the responsibility of the parents to teach the children, uh, especially uh, for us also. There are so many things like their Halloween that is being celebrated in Canada. 
and uh, you know people come to our houses for chocolates and other things and it's a fun activity but we we keep keep it a point to remind our children that we are not of the world we tell them stories about daniel how he daniel uh, you know sacrificed few things he did not uh, take on the customs of the world and so it's very important first of all uh, more than the child i think the parent has to realize whether it is right for his child to participate in this kind of things like whether he should participate in a holy function people are spraying colors and how, uh, how whether it is right or what whether it is wrong and uh, you know they take up pick up stories in the bible itself and then uh, because uh, at the end of the day the child will look at what the parent is doing and then he will do it now if you are going and celebrating diwali with your friends obviously the child will say okay what's wrong my father is going there he is he is eating good food on diwali so why should i not enjoy as well so these are the cultural things and uh, you know i think it's very important for us uh, that even in the old testament times god made it a clear distinction there is a reason why he he said that you know you should not follow the customs of the world because he is trying to inculcate in us that we are different we are set apart and that is what we also have to as parents i believe that we have to keep that in mind uh, remind them that we are in the world but we are not of the world so it's it's you know sunday school yes uh, we, we you know we, we can have all the things but i think more important is the duty and the role of the parent to ensure that that is been you know consistently communicated to them I think so. Um, I'm going yeah. to add something. I think Sister Nazrina was pointing out the limitations of parents also. Parents are also have a lot of limitations to talking to children about the, I mean, just like what brother said, to tell the children that we are not of this world, uh, like the spiritual language or will have uh, certain times uh, parents will have limitations to speak that's why it might be i think uh, uh, sister nazrina was suggesting if uh, in uh, those areas uh, if uh, uh, through sunday schools and all a supportive system could help i think so that's what she was mentioning and i also uh, felt something in agreement Yeah, can I add one thing? Um, are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes, Aunty, we can hear you. Yes, Aunty. I'm not really sure whether I had unmuted myself. Uh, what I wanted to say was that children are very open to logic and reasoning. They are more intelligent than we think they are, you know. so what we have to do is that even as we are telling them that this is not biblical that our god does not approve of such things such as diwali or holi we also have to tell them why give them a reason why those hindus are celebrating those festivals they are worshiping the demons they are so called gods with a small g so we have to familiarize ourselves with those stories or tales first and then tell them to the children that see what they are doing is worshiping those demons or idols their gods and they are offering uh, uh, making pujas and offering prasadams and those kind of things so we should not partake of them because our god has forbidden so when you give the pros and the cons then the children are really open to understanding you know they understand more than we think so not only just tell them that uh, we don't do it because we are christians uh, we also have to tell them why we don't do it why it is a practice that is against our beliefs that we do not uh, worship those so called gods we do not uh, for have those festivals because of 1 2 3 4 and they do understand 
So it is the duty of parents to know about these festivals and to tell them. There is nothing wrong in reading about Diwali, the origins of Diwali or the origins of Holi and uh, the Hindu festivals so that you are fully equipped and educated to tell your children why. Because they will always ask why. They don't understand the sovereignty of God, the commands of God. What they understand is what you explain to them, you know. Because all around them, they are seeing that pagan culture. So why it is uh, aberrant or hateful to us that we have to explain to them. And in a story form, so that they understand. So right up to, I think, uh, teenage years, a child will always be open to listening to stories. So first, parents, you know about those festivals. You understand what is the background of those. And then you can tell your children that this is the Hindu festival and this is against our things. And then you can show them the stories from the Bible where people have been faithful to God and how God has helped them through their trials, saved them. And then they understand the difference between the two, you know. So it's not just uh, to tell them that, no, no, our God doesn't approve or because we are Christians, we won't do it. That big question mark will always be there in their minds. So I, this is just a suggestion for parents with young children. Perhaps you can add or amend to whatever I have said. Thank you. Auntie, you are absolutely right, Auntie. We have to know the roots of it and explain to them. Secondly, I, I missed a lot of what Ravi spoke. I couldn't hear because my net was down. So I joined from my mobile. Uh, one more thing with regards to what Sister Nadrina said okay. that um, when, okay, Sunday school, they have activities. You cannot substitute one for another because they are missing out. The, the children of the world are having that fun. So let's have a different kind of fun. <laughs> you cannot substitute one for another and and then you'll always that will create always something that the children will want a substitute so you have to give them something else constantly look at uh, Psalm 16 Psalm 16 is a Psalm of David and, and I, it is so much apt for every one of us. Let me read the psalm for you. Preserve me, O God, for indeed do I, do I put my trust. Why is he saying preserve me or watch over me that I don't go anywhere else? O my soul that thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extended not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Who is that excellent? It is Christ. Even for children, you have to make them, uh, like auntie said, in story form, in all kinds of form, that Christ is the one in whom we should delight more than anything else in the world. And verse 5, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Come to verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. The parents themselves should be so attached to Christ and should be so joyful in Christ that the child should be able to feel that joy seeing my my mother or my father they they love Christ so much and the love of God has been poured in their hearts that they desire nothing else but Christ in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore only only in Christ can everything be fulfilled or can we have a fulfillment? Because Christ is 
what we require, what we desire, whom we have, <clears throat> whom we love so much. He's our everything. The moment you substitute one for another, you have to keep on substituting every, for every occasion. And you will end up in the same uh, position. Instead of giving them crackers, you have to give them something else. Instead of that, keep the focus on Christ and tell them the reason why we don't do it. I have heard people wishing uh, others happy Diwali, happy Dasra. Happy Mohram or Ramzan or whatever it is, Bakrit. Shall I say something? Yeah, it's absolutely oh, what uh, Gilbert brother and uh, Saroja auntie was sharing the hardcore truthful side of the reality. And that is what is as Christians need to practice. But uh, in that uh, practice, the real practice, it's accompanied with a lot of pains, sufferings. That's why people always uh, are resorting to alternate measures, which they call it as harmless. But this is what is we need truly need to practice. What I was uh, sharing earlier was uh, my B sister was speaking about there is a lot of practical scenario in a uh, culture where, especially in a, uh, India, say, now on us, government want to proclaim it as a Hindu country. So, a lot of the issues of fanatic way of uh, expressions in such scenarios might be as a single individual, individual Christian. It will be very tough, tough times for a parent. Or sometimes parents may not be in a Christian family. There might be uh, single persons, single parents who are coming to faith. So there um, there may be a lack of supportive background in all those situations. Uh, might be such parents who might think about the uh, support from the church background. But still, the hardcore truth is what uh, Sarvajanti and brother, Gilbert brother was sharing. Even though in the initial times, we might find it difficult. But slowly, slowly, if we, we are uh, in a position, if we uh, standing strongly in the faith and speaking truth to, to the children, it will truly work. That's what I do also have to say. Hope I'm clear. Yeah, very clear.
I know many Christians in our place also uh, seeing this happy Diwali, happy Dasra, and all kinds of festivals. Happy Onam here in PK Lapu. Uh, Onam is a very important function. We're in Kerala government give 10 days of holiday and even government celebrate it. So, you know, there are Christians I know through groups and all, they say, they also say this uh, happy one, happy Diwali and all. They call it as so harmless. It's very dangerous, it's deceptive. So, but those who, uh, those Christians who are daring to stand strong in every minute things will have more sufferings and God we need to pray to God uh, for the grace to endure that suffering Even the idea of Sunday school, Sunday school idea began in the 19th century or late 18th century. Prior to that, you read through the scriptures. You don't have any idea of Sunday school because uh, <clears throat> or junior church or, or senior church. This was all in the 19th century. Think of the first century, the children met along with the parents in the church. And it was the duty of the parents to explain to the children what was preached. And you come, you come down to the 15th, 16th century. In the same catechism that is meant for adults was also given to the children. And um, uh, if you go to England with the Westminster larger catechism, the children were made to learn all the 196 questions by heart. Then came the shorter catechism for them. And um, Martin Luther, I think, it was Martin Luther who, who made the children's catechism with one word answer, one or two words answer. He says, children before the age of three, as they begin to speak, constantly teach them the small catechism so that they will know with one word, two words they can answer. Never has the church substituted with fun and frolic because for the children, because the world is having it, let's also have it. Otherwise, children's, children might go astray. That's the difference also. Yeah. 